An interesting topic was mentioned in a previous session. The question was, what are you seeking? Tonight we will explore this question from both a scientific and a scriptural perspective. Then we will change the question to discover a unique perspective. You should find from this juxtaposition examination that the adversary has, once again, twisted truth to satisfy man's selfish desire. I find it quite interesting that what man proposes from their own knowledge, which is often called science, that it can be found in scripture. The issue is that man doesn't acknowledge this truth and twists it to align with man's concepts and desires. Even today, man continues to assert that they are humans who have a spiritual context if one chooses to go down that road. Before we begin our exploration, it might help to understand the word seek. It has a variety of meanings, some of which are quite interesting. To seek is to inquire, to search for something hidden, to crave, to desire, and in its archaic form, to worship. All of these add something unique to our individual understanding of the word seek as used in Matthew 6.33, which we will discuss later. Let's start with a very basic premise where science says that we need at least four basic elements to live on planet Earth. Water, air, food, and light. Similarly, Scripture tells us what we need to live spiritually in Jesus. Those things are water, air, food, and light. The main difference between the two is the perspective of man's being or his essence. We need to explore each item individually to better comprehend the interrelationship of the human body, the flesh and soul, and man's spirit. So sit back, relax, listen, and pretend that you are in science class. However, I do ask that you don't go brain dead like you did in high school. We'll begin with water. From a natural perspective, we know that water makes up 60 to 75 percent of our human body weight. A loss of just 4 percent of our total body water leads to dehydration, and a loss of 15 percent or more can be fatal. A person can survive a month without food, but they wouldn't survive three days without water. This crucial dependence on water broadly governs all life forms. Jeremiah 2.13 tells us that God is the living water. And from a spiritual perspective, we know that water is symbolic of Holy Spirit and of our connection with Jesus. Losing or wasting just 4% of our relationship with Jesus and Holy Spirit leads to our spiritual dehydration. Dehydration causes confusion and an inability to focus. This is why the adversary challenges our relationship with God so intensely. As we continue with this comparison uh, regarding science, hypothetically, if losing 15% of our total body weight of water if that is potentially fatal to our body, what would be the impact of losing or wasting 15% of our relationship with God on our spirit? Accepting deception and lies influences our mind, which can result in turning our backs to God or even rejecting Him. This confusion and inability to focus and making that choice is definitely a fatal move. Air is next. Air is the fundamental building block, apart from which life itself could not exist. 
oxygen is so important that it will lead to death if we are deprived of it for only a short period of time. Oxygen fuels our cells, helping provide the basic building blocks that our bodies need to survive, and it is necessary for constructing the replacement cells for our bodies. Oxygen plays an important part in our immune system. Job 33.4 provides the linkage between our individual creation and the impartation of life from the breath of God. It does so by saying that God is the breath of life. It is the breath of God within us that resuscitates our spirit, giving us new life that realigns our minds to his perspective and protects us. It is the indwelling of Holy Spirit that continually transforms us, replacing the dead cells with new, fully functioning ones. Without his breath, without his air, we are dead spiritually. Food is one element that we all enjoy. We need to eat food to supply the body with the correct nutrients that are required for healthy body functions. A balanced diet consists of food from all of the necessary food groups and in the right quantities. Food is required for growth. It is required for the brain to work and for the bones and organs to not only gain strength but to remain strong. Matthew 4, 4 states, But he replied, It has been written, Man shall not live and be upheld and sustained by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. This verse clearly states that God's truth provides the required nutrients for the body of Christ to function properly. It is the bread of God that helps us grow, mature, and remain strong in Him. In John 6.51, Jesus declared himself to be the living bread, and we are to partake of him. This partaking refers to how he abides within us with Holy Spirit, providing the enhancing spices of truth that strengthen and sustain us. We are also encouraged and instructed by Paul to move from milk to the meat of God's truth, wherein we mature spiritually. And lastly is light. Science has somehow determined that we have evolved to love light. Light provides necessary enrichment to our bodies. Light is a primary tool for perceiving the world and interacting with it. Without light, we can't see. In the natural realm, we depend on the sun's light for illumination. Our physical bodies have eyes and need light to show us where we are, where we need to go, and to help us see and avoid the myriad dangers that are around us. We have a good reason to have a natural fear of the dark, because it uses shadows to conceal dangers. Darkness veils the creatures, inanimate objects, and environments that can seriously injure us or kill us. In darkness, we don't know which way to go. Natural light shows us multiple paths to take, and it influences our perceptions of our surroundings. However, divine light shows us the way to go. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalms 119 verse 105. Divine light reveals what's true about our spiritual and our natural surroundings. Matthew 4.16 says, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Divine light gives us spiritual life. God, who said, Let, the, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Jesus is the light of life, John 8, 12, and he is the life of light, John 1, 4. Jesus embodies all that we know spiritual light to be and what it does. 
He is the way, showing us the way to go. He is the truth, revealing the truth to our spirit. And he is the life who gives us life and from whom we derive our very life. John 14, 6. And in his light, we not only see light, we become light in the Lord. Ephesians 5, 8. And therefore, we become, ourselves become the light of the world. Matthew five fourteen. Without light, there is only darkness. However, true light, Jesus, who is the truth, dispels and removes all darkness originating from the adversary. Thus far, we have seen that science itself points to God as being necessary to live on planet Earth, albeit science ignores the original and the true perspective that we are spiritual beings first. Now we need to examine the scientifically accepted and improved Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Maslow's model indicates that all humans share the same types of needs and that these categories of needs have a hierarchy. Generally speaking, this hierarchy goes from the basic things needed for survival all the way through to a sense of fulfilling our potential and finding our purpose in life. The hierarchy is important as, from a motivational perspective, it acts as a ladder. Maslow's model is what causes us to be motivated. And as a ladder, it means that individuals must have fully met their needs at their current level within the ladder before they are motivated to achieve the needs of the next level. Put more bluntly, an individual who is struggling to put a roof over their head will focus on that before exploring their true calling in life. There are times when a higher need is addressed before a lower need is fulfilled. However, as soon as that crisis is resolved, the lower needs are again primary. And we must remember that a higher need crisis is often caused by a lower need deficiency. So here are the levels. Level one, the physiological needs. The physiological needs include those that are vital to survival. These are the first things we need to achieve before we can move on towards the more complex and aspirational needs of life. Our physiological needs include our body requirements for sleep, food, and water, as well as the basics of shelter and clothing. If we lack any of these, we need to fulfill them before we can be motivated to pursue other needs. And Maslow included sexual reproduction in this level of the hierarchy as well. He included it because it's essential to the survival and the propagation of our species. Level two addresses safety needs. At this level, the needs for security and safety have become primary. These needs are about removing risk from life and helping individuals maintain their physiological needs into the future. Now, safety needs include physical and emotional security, housing beyond the most basic of shelters. Most of us would prefer a house over a tent. Health and financial security. Basically, people want control and order in their lives. Some of the ways of meeting these basic security and safety needs include financial security, health and wellness, safety against accidents and injury, finding a job, being able to obtain and keep health insurance and health care, putting money aside in a savings account, and even moving to a safer neighborhood. These are all examples of actions that we take that are motivated by security and safety needs. If you combine the safety and the physiological levels of Maslow's model, we see that these make up what is often referred to as basic needs. The next level, level three, is that of social belonging. This level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs introduces the need for social belonging. 
The model says that once individuals have met their physiological and safety needs, their next priority becomes the pursuit of social belonging. Humans are fundamentally social beings and the need for social belonging is strong in most people. They start to pursue relationships to gain a sense of acceptance and belonging. The social needs in the, this level include love, acceptance, and belonging. Now, some of the things that satisfy these needs includes friendships, romantic attachments, family relationships, social groups, and he even included churches and religious organizations. These are so that we can avoid loneliness, depression, and anxiety. It's important for people to feel loved and accepted by others. This is why personal and group relationships play an important role in satisfying this need. Level four is the one of self-esteem. Maslow's model says that once humans have met their needs for the social belonging, acceptance, appreciate, appreciation, and respect, then they start to focus on themselves and their self-esteem. These needs are all about satisfying the ego and being valued. Maslow chose to divide this need into two levels. At the lower level, individuals seek to achieve status to gain respect and recognition from others. At the highest level, they seek these same things from themselves. Self-esteem needs begin to play a more prominent role in motivating behavior. People have a need to accomplish things and then to have their efforts recognized. People need to sense that they are valued by others and feel that they are making a contribution to the world. People who are able to satisfy their esteem needs by achieving a good self-esteem and receiving recognition of others, these people tend to feel confident in their abilities. Conversely, those who lack self-esteem and do not get respect from others, they often develop feelings of inferiority. Now, together you take the self-esteem and the social belonging levels, levels four and three, put them together and that's what's known as the psychological needs of the hierarchy. But then there's one more level, level five. It's at the very peak of Maslow's model, and that is the self-actualization needs. This clunky phrase simply means that humans want to feel that they are fulfilling their potential and making the most of their abilities. Now, in many ways, this is similar to Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia, which loosely translates as fulfilling your true nature. Self-actualized people are self-aware. They're concerned with their personal growth and less concerned with the opinions of others. They're interested in fulfilling their potential. Maslow himself said of self-actualization, that it may be loosely described as the full use and exploitation of talents, capabilities, potentialities, and so forth. Such people seem to be fulfilling themselves and to be doing the best that they are capable of doing. They are people who have developed or are developing into the full stature of that which they are capable. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is how science, man's knowledge and opinion, has not only accepted, but actually instituted the adversary's age-old tactic of challenging one's identity and relationship with God. The adversary only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy and he focuses upon this proven method of creating doubt. After all, it was by planting the seed of doubt regarding Adam's identity and his relationship with God 
that he was able to deceive Adam. To top it off, Satan promised what God had already given to Adam. By challenging the identity and relationship of Adam with God, he established a successful and an ageless method of deceiving man by creating doubt in God's trustworthiness. This concept of deception is still in use today. The deception is that man needs provision and protection and that man himself can acquire and provide both. So, let's look at Maslow's model from that perspective. Regarding provision, which would include the physiological and social belonging categories, we waste food every day. People are dumpster diving for meals. We depend upon drugs to help us sleep and to have energy. Many are homeless and or they're wearing tattered and torn clothes, which results in a perception that they are less worthy within society. Therefore, they're being deprived of their social belonging by a society that just doesn't care about them. Now, when we look at protection, this includes the physiological, the safety, and the social belonging levels, and how they interact in the category of protection. People must feel secure with their physiological needs. In fact, they will do anything to gain and to protect these needs. Then, of course, one's social status must be protected, and they'll go so far as to destroy others' careers and families to protect their social status. We even see this deception every day in advertising. The advertising screams, protect your finances, secure your future, keep up with the elite of society, promote your contribution to secure your job, and the list goes on. The kicker to this is the adversary's lie of that you can do it. Now, this includes the social belonging, the self-esteem, and the self-actualization levels of Maslow's model. This is where the adversary has greatly encouraged man to be like God, since God is unworthy of your trust. This lie goes even more astray in suggesting that God has deprived you of something. When you look at every commercial on television today, you will find direct references to the needs of provision protection and how you can provide them yourself. Everything from finances to what health drinks are best for you depends upon you doing something. Each of these scientific concepts within Maslow's model addresses worldly matters and the needs of the soul and flesh. However, Scripture reveals the spiritual aspect of these needs and the provision that God gives to us. For the physiological needs, Deuteronomy 12.15 addresses food. However, you may kill and eat flesh in any of your towns whenever you desire, according to the provision for the support of life with which the Lord your God has blessed you. Psalms 4 verse 8 addresses sleep. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you, Lord, alone make me dwell in safety and confident trust. Psalms 65, 9 shows God provides the water. You visit the earth and saturate it with water. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. Luke eleven three. Then Luke 12, 22 through 23. To his Talmud, Yeshua said, Because of this I tell you, don't worry about your life 
what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. To address the safety needs, 2 Samuel 22 verse 33 says, God is my strength and protection. He makes my way go straight. Psalm 13 6, but I trust in your grace. My heart rejoices as you bring me to safety. I will sing to Adonai because he gives me even more than I need. Psalm 62 8, my safety and honor rest on God. My strong rock and refuge are in God. And then once again, Psalm 4 8, in peace I will both lie down and sleep for you, Lord, alone make me dwell in safety and confident trust. When we get to social belonging, we need to remember that within the kingdom of God, the children of God are all equal, yet each relationship is unique and special to God. Romans 8, 16 through 18 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our own spirits that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with the Messiah. <coughs> Galatians 2.19 For it was through letting the Torah speak for itself that I died to its traditional legalistic misinterpretation so that I might live in direct relationship with God. When we talk about self-esteem, when defined, we find that self-esteem is basically an unduly high opinion of oneself, vanity. Uh, let's put it in simpler terms, pride. Oh, that's right, pride was the original sin of rebellion. Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride goes before destruction and arrogance before failure. Isaiah 2, 17 says the pride of man will be bowed down. The arrogance of men will be humiliated. And when that day comes, Adonai alone will be exalted. And to me, when I look at the self-actualization, I see this as the most deadly. Because this is making yourself a god. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the craving for sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, the greeting longings of the mind, and the pride of life, the assurance in one's own resources or in the, in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but they are from the world itself. However, it is through relationship that we do achieve the fullness of who we are in Him. Colossians 2, 8-10 through 10. Watch out so that no one will take you captive by means of philosophy and empty deceit, following human tradition which accords with the element, elemental spirits of the world but does not accord with the Messiah. For in Him bodily lives the fullness of all that God is. And it is in union with Him that you have been made full. He is the head of every rule and authority. Remember, in the kingdom of God, there is no self. We are one body, the body of Christ. We are complete in Him. The body of Christ will achieve its self-actualization when it has become perfect and fully equipped to do the work of ministering, arriving in the unity implied by trusting and knowing the Son of God at full manhood, at the standard of maturity set by the Messiah's perfection. We will, in every respect, grow up into Him who is the Head, the Messiah. Under His control, the whole body is being fitted and held together by the support of every joint, with each part working 
to fulfill its function. This is how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So, once again, without realizing it, science has proven Scripture, God's very Word, to be true. But is the question we're addressing really, what are we seeking? Maybe it's better to ask what are, who is seeking us? The adversary only seeks us to kill, steal, and destroy God's plan. God pursues us to save us from the adversary's plan. The adversary promises us things of this world, things that man has produced for his own pleasure. God promises things of his kingdom, righteous things that he created for his and our pleasure. The adversary leads one to death. God leads one to life. So which one has your ear? And which one are you listening to? We have a promise from God that addresses all of our needs. Notice that I said needs, not wants. God satisfies all our needs. And in His love, His generosity, and His grace, He sometimes grants us our wants beyond measure. Most of us are familiar with Matthew 6.33, which says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given to you as well. However, are you just as familiar with the preceding verses? For it is in these verses that we find God's love for us in meeting all of our needs. I'll start at verse 19. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So when you look at these verses, you see that they address every physiological, psychological, and personal need that we have. Remember, the word seek is to inquire, to search for something hidden, to crave, to desire, and to worship God. We are to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, for in doing so, our questions are answered. He reveals that which was hidden. Our craving for Him and His ways are satisfied. His desires become our desires, and we celebrate Him through worship. He meets all our needs in abundance. We are to have an intimate, unique relationship with our Heavenly Father, with His Son, our friend, lover, and Lord Jesus, and with Holy Spirit. It is through our seeking Him and His kingdom, through our relationship, that He reveals truth regarding our identity and our purpose, our searching for the hidden mysteries, our desiring the hidden mysteries, our craving for the truth results in Him revealing the hidden mysteries that can only be found in Him and His kingdom through our relationship with him. Therefore, the answer to the question of what or who are we seeking is that we are to always seek him and his kingdom in spirit and truth.